Hi, I'm Eleanor Marie Rose and I'm here chatting with Richard Charkin about his life in publishing. Hello everyone, I'm Richard Charkin. I am a non-executive director of Bonnier Books UK and I'm here to talk to Eleanor about I have no idea what. <laughs> So, as you mentioned, you are a non-executive director of Premier Books UK. What does that actually mean for a lot of people out there that have no idea what the gibberish is in publishing? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, with luck, as a non-executive director, on a day-to-day -day basis, you do absolutely nothing. <laughs> and that's the hope. I think the job involves a number of things. Firstly, um, to be a representative of the owners and a representative of the executive team. So you're balancing the two. I completely think it is my responsibility and the responsibility of other non-executive directors um, to keep the owners informed if I have any concerns. Fortunately, I don't. Mm -hmm. Equally, it's my job to support the team who run this business, who do it day to day, who live it 24 7. Uh, and there is nothing worse than a non executive director who second guesses, backseat drives an executive team. Sure. Um, and I've had some of them myself, so I know how irritating it is. So I do my best not to do that, although. <laughs> Let's take it back a bit. How did you get your first job in publishing? What was your first job? Okay, my very, very first job. I, I'd left university and I'd managed to persuade the Sunday Times to pay for a trip to, for me to go to America through a friend of mine um, to do a report on uh, environmental damage being done in the state of Utah. I wrote it. Researched it, I wrote it, I submitted it, they accepted it, and they sent me a cheque for £10. It had taken me three months. <laughs> um, and so I, I said to the editor, why, why only £10? He said, well, you're not a member of the National Union of Journalists. If you were, we'd have paid much more. And I said, well, how do I get to do that? He said, well, you write another four or five like that. I said, I'd starve forty pounds or fifty pounds for a year's work. I mean, that's a. Or he said, go into book publishing. They're recruiting. So, uh -huh. so um, I applied to every book publisher in London. I had fifty letters. I was rejected by Hodder, I remember, and by HarperCollins or Fontana, which was their paperback imprint. Uh, and then I got a job at a company called George Harrop in High Haven as a commissioning editor, their first science editor, because I had a degree in science. So that was my first job. Uh, and it was an amazing apprenticeship because everything in that company was in the building. The warehouse, the accounting, it wasn't a computer, of course. Um, the production department, the publicity and marketing, foreign rights, and not one of them was interested in science books. So the only way I could get my books out and sold was to learn how to do it all myself. Uh, and no one cared because they didn't <laughs> care. So I did, and I made innumerable mistakes at their expense. Um, and I, yeah, that's, that was my first job. And, uh, I couldn't have been luckier. Yeah, was, impressive. Yeah. Uh, so, so that person at the Sunday Times, you'll really owe a lot to them for saying, actually, you should go into book publishing. Oh, <laughs> Give me that idea. How hard do you think it was then getting into publishing compared to now? Well, it's very, very different, I think, safely so. It was much more amateur. So the process of recruitment was really if you know, you'd see someone if they liked you or you, you know, or if you met someone in a pub and they said, oh, I know there's a job going somewhere and you applied and you got it, well, you didn't get it. And it was, it was very informal. Um, and in a way, that, that was easier for some, but of course, mm -hmm. incredibly harder for others who didn't have any sort of network at all. I had my friend at the Sunday Times. You know, if you didn't have that friend, none of this would have happened. Sure. 
So I, I think it was very difficult if you didn't come from a university background, a middle class mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and that's been one of the weaknesses of the industry, frankly. Uh, and now it's being addressed and redressed and we're getting a much more diverse workforce coming in, but probably not as diverse as it ought to be. I mean, that's, if, if I had to pick the one change in the workforce, it's been the emergence of women publishers. Okay. Oh, and how, 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 how they have improved almost every bit of the industry. Do you think it's still necessary to have a university degree in English and uh, publishing? No. No? I mean, if I look back at the most successful publishers, in, I'm just about to do my 50th year. And the most successful, I don't think they had degrees. Um, they were entrepreneurs. They, they, underst they understood what people wanted. They understood what writers wanted. Uh, and they got on with it. Um, so I'm not sure the degree itself, and I'm not sure that the postgraduate degree either. Mm -hmm. I think the postgraduate degree is valuable because of the transferable skills, and I think it's also valuable in showing that you, you really are determined. So you just mentioned there as well about your 50th anniversary in publishing, right. which is incredible. Um, I'm sure in that time you've obviously spoken to a lot of people, worked with a lot of big names. Have you yeah. got any stories, any fun, fun, fun stories to tell from your 50 years? Um, well, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try one. Um, I was in New York meeting with the head of Warner Books um, and he, when we were talking about this stuff and the other, his phone rang and his boss, the head of Warner Worldwide, mm -hmm. called him up and he came back 10 minutes later and said, oh, my boss has just spent $25 million on this woman and she's going to do a record and a video and there's a book uh, and I've been landed with picking up five million dollars <laughs> of the advance for the book and I said well I'll tell you what I'll if you'll let me I'll give you a million of that back for outside US rights in this book and he said fine um, I thought I was mad. <laughs> and so did I. Um, and uh, anyway, the book was called Sex by Madonna. And we sold, it was only on sale for two days because each, it sold out on its first wow. day, 180,000 copies at 25 pounds a pop wow. in 1980, whatever this was. <laughs> so that was a lot of money. And we reprinted 180,000. It sold out on the same day. 360, non American. Um, so I went to the launch party, which was in the meat packing district of New York. I've never been more scared in my life. <laughs> Have you got any other ones, even smaller ones, other big names? Other big names. Um, There's one of the things I did was rescue an author from the pits. Um, he'd been a successful author, well, a very successful author, and he was found to have committed perjury in court and was sent to jail. And while he was in jail, and his publisher sacked him because they didn't want to be associated with him. Um, and while he was in jail, I, I was in contact with him. And he decided he wanted to write some non-fiction about being in prison. It was called The Prison Diaries. He wasn't allowed to make money out of, out of his crime, so we didn't pay in advance. But we got a large amount of money for the serial rights uh, for the Daily Mail. And, um, and then when he came out, uh, he then handed us all his fiction and his new fiction with Jeffrey Archer. And uh, and he's really recovered from yeah. that, from the very low point of being a, again a bestseller. And, um, he's having his 80, belated delayed 80th birthday dinner on Friday, 
To which I'm going. Uh, I was so, going to say, have you got an invite? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're still, so he, he does credit me with paying him out of jail and sort of thing. Um, so you, you've worked in the publishing industry for almost 50 years. You've mm. met some fantastic names, worked on all mm. these books. What are the kind of major changes that you've seen since the beginning, early years of the publishing industry to now? I think I mentioned earlier the dominance of male management. Mm has changed completely and for the better. Um, clearly digital production, digital distribution um, has changed the world a lot. Globalization, I mean, we used to think that Scotland was international, actually it may become international once more <laughs> if, if this government continues its way, but nonetheless, I suppose the corporations, the size of publishers. I mean, when I started, nearly all the pub, 90% of publishers were family owned. Um, and I mean, my first one, there was a, it's called Harrop, there was a Mr. Paul, the Mr. <laughs> Ian, and the Mr. Someone else, Walter. Um, and that was the family. Uh, and they just had this one building and, and they did it. And, and I would think, I don't know, they didn't have, book scan numbers, mm. but I would think the 90% of books came from these small, independent, mm. typically family-owned businesses. Now, it's a very different cup of tea. They're the top four or five big trade publishers uh, control 80% of the market. Sure. Yeah. Um, is that good? Is it bad? I don't know. Uh, other big change is the rise of literary agencies who were, again, independent people. They were typically a person. Mm. Mr. Curtis and Mr. Brown, I suppose. Um, and now they, they themselves are corporations with HR departments and legal departments and accounting. So these, these are pretty mega changes. The fundamentals haven't changed. You're going to find someone to pay money to buy the thing. Sure. And then most yeah. importantly, you have an author to write yeah. it. What lessons have you personally taken from some of those changes? Never ever under, underestimate the power and speed of technology change. It will go faster than you ever thought, and it will be more, more powerful, if that's the right word. Um, so even though the ebook is still only 15, 20% of the market, it's changed perceptions. And the next iteration will be something else which we've got no idea. Things are happening, and if, if we underestimate them, we'll be in deep trouble. So we have to go along with it. I, I would say the other lesson is um, making mistakes, experimentation is unbelievably important. And one of the criticisms I would have of some of the big corporations naming their names is uh, fear of failure. Uh, and therefore you have layers of management control and which can kill experimentation because mm -hmm. no one wants to make a mistake and particularly you don't want to make a mistake if people are going to point fingers at you and, uh, and oh. all that sort of thing. So um, doing things riskily, but I, I, the, from my point of view, the thing is you take as many risks as you but you lay them off as much as you can as well, simultaneously. So that the net damage, if it all goes sure. wrong, isn't <laughs> too terrible. So what advice do you have for the kind of the fresh faces of the industry, like myself, like people that are just stepping into the industry? So you've got a job in the industry, what's yeah, the advice? Yeah. Be incredibly nosy. Be inquisitive. Ask questions. Don't take answers just because they say that's it. Keep asking, because there are a million things we do imperfectly mm -hmm. in this industry. And the only way it's going to change is from within mm -hmm. and from the young people coming in and relearning, which is what I had to do when mm -hmm. I started. But, so I think inquisitiveness. And I think the other piece of advice I would have is that uh, don't worry about your career. Worry about your job.
do what you're doing as well as you can. The career looks after itself. And more specifically, so for the people that have got job now at Bonnie Books UK, yeah. what do you want to see from us? What's the future of Bonnie Books UK? Uh, well, what is our job? And uh, you know, what is anyone's job? What is a publisher's job? It is actually to allow authors to speak to their readership with as little interference as possible. As much interference as is necessary, but as little as you can. And so what do we want with Body of Books UK? We've got a great tradition, Scandinavian tradition, which is really important. And then we have great owners. I can't tell you, I've, I've, I've uh, I was going to use the word suffered, that's not the right <laughs> word. Uh, I've enjoyed very different sorts of ownership structures. Public company, big public company, Reed Elsevier, small public company, Bloomsbury, uh, private company, George Harrop, startup company, Current Science, which I see, uh, um, you name it. Oh, German owned company, family owned company, Macmillan, uh, and and Bonnier, and I have to say that the ownership structure is as good as it could be. They, <laughs> this sounds ridiculous, but they really like owning us. <laughs> <laughs> Which it shouldn't need to be said, but actually, there are places where the owning business doesn't mm. really want to own it, and but the owners of Simon and Schuster didn't want to own it, and, and it, it permeates the business. So, this is a much loved business. By its own shape. So that, thank goodness. Um, so what do we want to see? We want to see it light on its feet. We want to see it take risks. We want to see it grow the digital bit. We need to be sustainable. We have to, we have to address the issues of wastage. Mm -hmm. um, I, a personal be in my bonnet is the ghastly wastage of stock. The print that you print. You drop down a tree, you send it to Smiths and they send half them back and you, you pulp the damn things. Or you send them to Australia on a sodding plane. Take out sodding. <laughs> you take to Australia on a plane. Um, you know, this, and then they come back on a plane. You know, this is insane. Um, and so the more we can deal with the returns mm. issue and control of stock, the, the mm. more sustainable we are. You know, very practical. You know, it's not a philosophical Issue, it's a practical issue. Sure. Um, and body is and you know, finding new talent, taking risks with new authors. I think particularly important is the children's division. Um, because that's that's our future, that's their future. Literacy is very really important. And and we have in our leadership team, and I don't include, I don't think a lot of executives are the leaders, the leaders are for Minda and John and Kennedy and Kate and all the rest of it. Um, they are, I don't know what to compliment them to. <laughs> uh, they are actually very aware, they're very benevolent, they're very understanding, they hear, they listen, uh, and they try to implement mm -hmm. good things, not just making money. Um, we have to make money, we have to be commercial, otherwise, uh, we owe it to our owners to give them something for, for, for the trust they've given us. What, um, what is the modern day publisher to you? That's what everyone wants to know. What, what's the modern day publisher? What do you think that is? How do we get there? I don't know. I really don't know what the modern day publisher is. If I knew, I'd probably be doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying with my little business called Mensch Publishing, which I'm trying to be a modern publisher. Uh, with an old body, um, but I don't know. I think I, I think a number of things. But one is speed. Um, I mean, I find it extraordinary. It still takes a year to publish a book. What, what, what is all this? Um, I just I just think it's pointless um, and a waste of money and ties up capital. And you know. um, modern, I think, also means. Thinking about other media, the book isn't the only bit of intellectual property. I mean, we are intellectual property traders. The, f the format of that 
intellectual property is less relevant than the quality. And the quality is defined by the author and, and the rights that one is allowed to, to do. Um, so, but I don't really have an answer for what a modern publisher looks like. Um, I think this is one. I think this is about the most modern publisher I've come across. Um, yeah, actually. <laughs> um, except for my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are going to finish off Richard Chucky with some quick fire questions. Um, so the first thing that comes to your mind, let it out. Um, okay, so who is your favourite author? Um, William Shakespeare. I've published him, all his works, three times in different companies. Each of them has been a success and he's never written me a letter from <laughs> Nice, I like that. Um, what's on your bedside table? At the moment, yeah. Ian Sinclair. Uh, all about Hackney, where, where I happen to live. Nice. Um, what is What would be the name of your life story if it was on a book? Uh, I've just done my best. <laughs> nice. Um, who is the one author that you would have personally loved to have published? I'll tell you the one that I'm, I most liked publishing and would have liked to have continued was Sue Townsend. Okay, perfect. And uh, to, find, to finish off, um, who would be, dead or alive, your dream literary guest at a dinner party? Strange one, but Howard Jacobs. Okay, because he makes me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> we like that. Okay, and that's all we have time for. So thank you very much, Richard Chucking, for sharing your insight into the publishing industry. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>